technology is the most powerful change in the world of education. Everything changes. Welcome to the Emerging Technologies in Education podcast, delivered to you by Clever Books Company. Listeners, and I'm happy to introduce our guest, who is Anne Marie Clark. And um, I think the best thing to do is like I let um, Anne Marie speak and introduce herself. What is she doing, and what country you're from? Hi, Anne Marie. Hi. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to take part in this podcast. Um, as the listeners have already heard, my name is uh, Anne Marie Clark. I'm recently Dr. Anne-Marie Clark, I'm proud to say. I live and work in the beautiful west of Ireland uh, as an art and religion teacher in post-primary schools. Uh, to many other countries, post-primary here in Ireland would be high school or secondary school. Um, I'm teaching for many years, uh, having started out in the UK after graduating with a Bachelor of Education. I later moved to Ireland and started teaching in my current school, Jesus and Mary Secondary School here in the west of Ireland in Ennis Crown. I stayed in touch uh, with developing my pedagogy throughout my teaching career and pursued a master's degree in Trinity College in Dublin where I researched and developed a growth development portfolio for transition year students. And just to explain, transition year students uh, are a cohort of students who opt to enrol on a program, a full year's program, which is specifically designed to develop their personal, social, educational and vocational skills. Now that portfolio, which was developed throughout that research, is now an online e-portfolio using a program uh, known as MightyY.ie. Um, I later capped my professional development with a doctorate from Queen's University Belfast, where my research took me into e exploring digital storytelling with post-primary teachers of different subject disciplines. And since achieving my doctorate, I am now currently a member of the research faculty of Hibernia College Dublin, which is an online college, um, where I supervise and facilitate graduate teachers in their research. I am also on the research su uh, subcommittee for ethics. That sounds brilliant. And I hear already that you are using a lot of technology in teaching and uh, online resources and online schools. So can you then tell me a little bit more, like what is your attitude towards um, technology in education? Is it negative or positive and why you think so? Well, um, I suppose I'd have to give you a little bit of history of my view of technology uh, throughout my teaching career. Um, let me begin by defining technology from my point of view. Um, as far back as the 1970s, when I was training to teach, I was introduced to what we called a duplicating machine. It was called a banda. And that machine was a means of getting the teacher's notes and information out to large numbers of students. So to me, that was the start of my technology journey. And this progressed to a machine known as a Gestetner. It was powered by electricity. The bander you had to keep twisting with your arm. Um, now, the Gestetner, named after its creator, uh, reached a much wider audience because of its speed. And then things started progressing and speeding up. The video recorder was introduced into classrooms. And that enabled the teacher to bring the outside world into the lesson. It enabled the teacher to record places and events to share with students and make the lessons more meaningful. Then along came the internet. My first whole staff computer course was actually way back in the 1980s. And I found it very exciting. 
I knew it was going to open new avenues, but I quickly realized I was not going to develop my use of the internet and technology unless I could practice it, just like a piano student is wasting their time taking piano lessons unless they have a piano at home. I too needed a computer. Now in the early days, they were very, very expensive. So I saved hard and I bought uh, a desktop computer for the family home and the rest is history. Uh, when technology arrived in Irish schools, I would say that I was, I wouldn't claim to be ahead of the norm, but I would say that I was ahead in my positive attitude towards its use uh, within the classroom. To the point where today I would be the teacher who says to my students, OK, take out your phones because they're carrying so much technology in their pockets. And I take advantage of that every day. Young people are using mobile phones and technology for social purposes. I am a teacher and it is my job to teach them how to use those phones for educational purposes. Um, so basically, that's my attitude towards the use of technology in the classroom. I'm very positive about it. Uh, it can enhance student learning and I just integrate it into most of my lessons. Yeah, that's brilliant point. And I think you are so right because uh, students, they take the phones, they take the tablets and they carry them to school. And I loved your point that it is important to convert them rather than using them only for social purposes, but also use it for the educational purposes. Because there is so much things out there and the smartphone that is literally a small computer could be used for so many good things like reading and learning on the go as well. Um, okay, so the next question is, which technology can be a good supplement for education in your opinion nowadays? Um, in terms of like using the mobile phone or tablet, um, like maybe some learning resources, open libraries or anything that you can have in mind and why you think so? Um, well, I wouldn't like to promote any particular one. Um, there's an awful lot of apps which students can download onto their, their phones, their tablets and their computers. Um, and I can only, um, I suppose, comment on the ones that I, I use in particular. For example, I would use uh, apps such as Kahoot and Padlet for homework to make the homework more engaging and more exciting. It does not take away the writing homework if it is necessary or the drawing homework for their art, but it does engage them and it enhances their learning. Um, clickers in the classroom is another really engaging app which I use with my students when I want to recap on a previous lesson. Um, and then there are programs which I, as an art teacher I would naturally use such as Movie Maker, Photoshop and I really would like to recommend My TY as a program because it is something that post primary students use and they are trained into what to expect when they get into college. They can, they can place all their work into a library, building up a portfolio. They can write their weekly or daily blog. They can keep their calendar. They can um, develop PowerPoints and uh, research projects. Uh, they, can take, they can create films and they can upload these all into the one place and they can access this from anywhere in the school and from home. And I also try and promote this in trying to engage parents too. So I suppose if you were to really tie me down, my, my pet uh, passion is digital storytelling. Now my students will create digital stories, uh, but I also create digital stories uh, as an instructional tool. Now, there's lots of research out there as to the value of digital storytelling um, for student learning. Uh, 
Would you like me to explain about my own research into digital storytelling for instruction? Absolutely. I wanted actually to ask you, can you tell me a little bit more how you do that? What is the outcome and maybe feedback of the students, like anything that you can share on these topics, please? OK, right. Well, just to explain to those uh, listeners who are not uh, fully uh, understanding what digital storytelling is. It's basically a story. We all tell stories. We live story lives. Our students have stories. They bring their stories into the classroom. The teachers have stories. Some teachers are storytelling teachers. And I'm afraid, not afraid, but uh, I am a storytelling teacher. And so we have story at the base of it. A digital story is where you knit and integrate visual images with the story and possibly enhance it by sound or music in the background. Now, a digital story is normally only approximately three minutes in length. So from the point of view of um, reflecting, a student can reflect on a large project they've been doing by creating a digital story about that project, the challenges they felt, um, the successes they uh, experienced and and basically how they feel about it. From the point of view of uh, creating a digital story for instruction, as an art teacher, uh, my students come to me and they love the practical side of the subject. In Ireland, art history is 33% of the final grade for the senior cycle leaving certificate art. So it comes to teaching art history lessons. Now, being a teacher who is constantly looking for innovative ways, I would have used YouTube, um, virtual galleries, um, visuals, uh, using laptops. I have laptops in my art room specifically for uh, not just the practical, but for art history and constantly finding ways to keep my students engaged because they much prefer the practical to the theory. And it was while I was over in Atlanta uh, that I, sharing best practice, that I came across this digital storytelling. And of course, it was students who were creating the digital stories. But when I came back to Ireland, I thought I could make use of those. Now, most storytelling teachers will tell you when you start to tell a story, the pens go down, they sit and they listen. Now, a story is never too long or shouldn't be a good story. And especially if the story is about yourself, because they're curious, they're curious about you. And this, of course, all depends on the relationship you have with your class. So I was teaching um, the Renaissance and I created a digital story based on my experience of seeing the statue of David in Florence for the first time. Now, I had taught all about the statue of David, its sheer size, enormity of it, for so many years. But the day I stood in front of it in Florence, I was in awe, to the point I was so emotional, I cried at the beauty of this statue. And I made a digital story based on, on my story. And I could not get over the success which followed. I had 100% uh, engagement, but the feedback that came back in the essays, they had bought in to my experience in understanding the beauty of the work of the Statue of David by Michelangelo. So after that, I proceeded to, proceeded to make lots of digital stories. I had a bank of them. And that served another purpose because my students could access that bank anytime. And into the digital story, I put uh, uh, either keywords, terms, concepts, things that I wanted the students to learn. They were hearing a story and they were inadvertently learning at the same time. Now, when teachers talk about uh, things that happen in the classroom, they are more likely talking about things that work and this was working for me. So while I was pursuing my doctorate in Queens, I decided I would concentrate my research on digital storytelling. So 
so I, I invited colleagues within my school from different subject disciplines because I was curious would this could this tool digital storytelling work within other subjects across the curriculum so we came together as a group and one of the important processes of digital storytelling is story circle sharing sharing ideas sharing the story and helping each other to edit and work on it so there was a business teacher a maths teacher an english teacher and a design communication technology teacher we use the acronym dcg in ireland for that subject and they each went off and created instructional digital stories and they all came back reporting the same thing accelerated learning full engagement deeper understanding so that as you can understand you know i just find digital storytelling is effective because it's not from a textbook written by someone else it's the teacher's own lesson and it has been created and put into a short something like a film and it can be stored i find it absolutely amazing because this is a great example on how technology could be really engaging and supplementary for the teachers and also internet is also another technology which actually gives access to the teachers and to the students to have these uh, pictures and videos and information that could be accessed around the world if we go back to the days where there was no internet we had access to the library and that was it whatever we had locally and now we have the whole potential of creating such an amazing digital stories like you do so this is like really really great example thank you so much um i have another question to you um so some teachers might reject technology in the classroom of any kind of technology um why do you think um they might reject it to think long and hard about that i i wouldn't uh like to say why they reject it as much as I'd like to point out uh, two researchers, Leave and Wenger, who theorise that learning is embedded in social practice. It invo involves the whole person. And in using their words, it implies becoming a full participant, a member, a kind of person. So taking that on board, unless it is developed as a community of practice within a school unless a school embraces uh, the, the idea of technology it is very difficult for teachers who might fear it or who are quite stubborn in accepting change it is it is very difficult for them to get on board with the using of technology so it isn't an individual thing it's a whole community, it's a whole school community approach that is needed for it. And within my, I should go back to my research for this, within my research, we actually inadvertently developed a community of practice based on a technology tool. And we, we bought into it. So teachers need to be, they need to buy into, and it's the leadership within the schools that need to enable the teachers to buy in. There is research uh, by Clark in Northern Ireland, where um, newly qualified, not, not newly qualified teachers, training, training teachers, while out on teaching practice, were each given iPads, and they were sent out into schools to use the iPads as part of their teaching practice. And when they returned, some had used them successfully, Others hadn't used them as successfully because the climate in the school was not conducive to the use of technology. And so therefore there was a different mindset. Now, we have to be very careful as well because we have to keep a balance. Traditional methods alongside the integration of technology is so, so important. And I shall mention two other researchers here. Uh, Mishra and Kola, who developed the concept of TPAC, that's technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge. Now, every teacher in our schools have the content knowledge. 
they had that when they trained in their initial degrees. They know their subject. Their pedagogy is how they teach that subject. And some teachers are so ingrained in a particular methodology, it is hard perhaps to move them unless it's a whole school approach. And to integrate technology into that pedagogy, it is so, so important, using the words of Leven and Wenger, to embed it in social practice. And I think that is a way of getting around teachers who, and I know I haven't asked, answered your question, why do I think they uh, reject technology? I, I'm not so sure teachers reject it. But I do, I am aware that some teachers are fearful of it. And there's also a classroom management concept here. There's a teacher who, can, who, who is in charge of the classroom, who is responsible for what goes on in that lesson. And therefore, there's a feeling of empowerment and control in a positive way, not a negative way. And when students know more than the teacher, sometimes, some teachers find that quite challenging. So if they're not 100% with the technology and their students are, some teachers may find that difficult. Other teachers are fine with it. But I go back once again to saying a whole school approach is needed. If we had that in every single school, I don't think we would have teachers rejecting technology. This is brilliant. That was really insightful. Um, yeah, you answered my question fully, and I think this is uh, really important that uh, the whole school approach uh, should be uh, for using technology. Because my point of view personally is that technology is inevitable because remember still the days when there was the landline and nobody wanted the mobile phone, and all of a sudden, all of us, a uh, couple of decades decade later, have mobile phone in their pocket and feel it's normal until it's the way it's supposed to be. So I think that um, this is something that is going to come to schools anyway. I honor to have you at this podcast and I think it was brilliant insight and a lot of great ideas and also the outcomes of the podcast that listeners would be able hopefully to implement some of the tools that you are using like the digital storytelling. I find it absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, I hope and I, I do believe um, change will come. I do know that here in the West of Ireland, some teachers as well, I might add, uh, our, our internet access uh, is not always uh, 100%. So I think, you know, we need to step that up as well, uh, especially in rural areas. So some teachers may be fearful of uh, a breakdown of internet connection in order to use technology. So um, once we have that reaching its maximum and we have schools taking it on board generally in a more positive manner, I think we will we'll continue going forward with it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I wish to have a great evening and I hope all the listeners really enjoyed listening to us. Thank you. Thank you very much and thanks for the invitation. Everything changes.